Hello. Um, today, for the uh, <clears throat> uh, 300th uh, episode of this series, I thought it'd be interesting to just go through like my favorite filmmakers, and I have a list here uh, because I thought it'd be good to have like a list to, to go off of, and um, you know, maybe not necessarily like. Uh, <clears throat> go through all their films because in many cases I've talked about th their various films or plan to at some point um, and so I think it would be good to at least go through like my top 10 um, and this is actually kind of hard because you know it's like I you know you know you have some who are you whose works you really love and there's others that you enjoy their movies, but then it's like, well, do I really enjoy their movies to the extent of I put them in my list of top favorite like filmmakers? And if so, where would I put them? Would they be high or they low or you know wherever? Um, I'm only gonna limit it to ten. And again, you know, this is of course my own list, um, and sometimes lists do change. So, and I've actually changed this here and there especially particularly just for this video because I wanted to do something very special uh, and different um, so again sometime maybe some of these might change in order some might not um, but at number 10 I've got a uh, Michael Mann who you know made has made it uh, a lot of great films heat I think is the one movie that people often talk about and um, for great reason excellent crime drama um, you like the bad guy just as much as the, the good guy <clears throat> De Niro and Pacino are excellent um, Val Kilmer is great too and, uh, yeah, I mean the entire supporting cast of that film is incredible I, I could go on and name names but it's like you know <laughs> don't want to just talk about that film I think I have talked about that before anyway so you know there's that um, you know, made the first Hannibal Lecter film uh, or at least the first film with uh, Hannibal Lecter um, Manhunter which is based on Red Dragon but not at all connected to the Hannibal Lecter series that we all know um, with like Anthony Hopkins, you know, that film does not exist in that universe. Um, mainly because it didn't do well at the box office, and so the rights went up for sale because uh, Dino De Laurentiis didn't want to have anything to do with that. And so when Silence of the Lambs, of course, was a huge <clears throat> hit, he then got the rights back. And so, uh, interesting how all that came about. But anyway, you know, Manhunter itself is a very fine film. Brian Cox, as Hannibal Lecter, did well, but, you know, he, was, he wasn't in the film very long, nor is his presence felt throughout the entire film. He's just, he, he shows up in the scene, in a scene, in a, behind, in prison, and then behind bars, and that's really it. Not all that, uh, exactly important to the entirety of the plot you know compared to the other uh, installments with Hannibal Lecter but you know nice to see a first film of that character um, in The Insider with Pacino um, and uh, Russell Crowe that's an incredible movie you know, inspired by or based on a true story um, very well done he made Ali that's a great movie um, just the techniques and stuff that he, you know, also just utilizes and has inspired many people with his movies, um, one of which I will probably get to. But, you know, I, I, I do like Michael Mann's work. He's really incredible. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's a very respectable uh, director. And, you know, even if uh, he's made some... <clears throat> Films that are failures in the sense of financially. And also, Public Enemies, I want to mention. That's a great film, also. Um, 
just incredible, just fantastic. Uh, maybe that's another great film, honestly. Um, but, you know, um, great director. Um, uh, my ninth favorite director is Orson Welles. Um, great actor, director, writer, producer. Of course, he did Citizen Kane and also Magnificent Ambersons. Uh, Chimes of Midnight are that's fantastic. Um, uh, he's just incredible. Um, utilizing techniques that have been done before and just putting them together all uh, at once for the first time, like for Citizen Kane. You know, that's incredible. Now, of course, he uh, didn't invent these techniques, but, you know, he... Uh, he did uh, an incredible job of utilizing the, uh, all these techniques at once. And there's also a, a touch of evil, where he's like the bad guy, you know. Uh, he's just fantastic. Um, uh, does fantastic work in that, you know. And the thing is, he's, like, you know, actor in basically everything he's ever, you know, made. Um, even if it's just like a voiceover role. Uh, uh, he, he's always in there. So he's very, very evolved. Very, has like a personal touch to <clears throat> basically everything he would do. And that's just uh, fantastic. Um, yeah. So Orson Welles is my ninth favorite uh, my favorite director or director or filmmaker, whatever. Uh, number eight is Akira Kurosawa, you know, director of Yojimbo, Sinjuro, uh, Seven Samurai, Hidden Fortress, which inspired one of my uh, favorite films, and uh, Ron, and uh, you know, so many, so many films. Is he was one of the first, like, really notable Japanese filmmakers to truly uh, have their stamp uh, uh, in the world and influence on other films. Not that others didn't come before or after him, but you know, Kurosawa is somebody who people just like. If you were to just say like, like name like one. Japanese filmmaker, I think Kurosawa would always be near the top, if not the top, in terms of people saying it. You know, you might get some like Ozu, but I think Kurosawa will most likely be will always top that list in terms of like how many people would, would say like their name. And, you, know, you know, and I think because of uh, his influence in certain filmmakers and certain films. Um, I think that's part of the reason why, you know, people look at his movies and they see the, um, uh, just the incredible work. And one thing that he did for, like, World War II was he wasn't going to make, like, propaganda films. Like, the movies he was directing, he wasn't going to be, like, anti-American or whatever, because, you know, he wanted people to see all of his movies. Like, once World War II ended, you know, other places around the world might want to actually see his movies, and if there's a bunch of anti-American or anti-allies <clears throat> to America sentiments in those films, people will probably would just dismiss them and want nothing to do with it, uh, his movies. And so I think that was a smart choice on his part. Um, some people, though, were sort of just drafted and had no real uh, choice in the matter. Um, you know, sometimes they would be voluntary to help get people amped up into whatever militaries and well there's nothing really wrong with that um you know depending on the kind of film like you know well then again many of those cases were like documentary type stuff or little promotional things but you know for feature films you know you didn't want to make any like propaganda pieces which i think in a lot of in the long run it was probably a smart move on his uh on his part due to the fact that it helped bring more people to see his 
films uh, years later and enjoy them. Um, I think that was great uh, on his part, uh, or at least smart, great, smart, whatever you want to say. But you know, I think that did help in a lot of ways. My seventh favorite um, filmmaker is uh, Francis Ford Coppola. Um, you know, Godfather trilogy. I love those films. Uh, Apocalypse Now is excellent. The conversation is uh, an incredible gem. Rain people. Um, uh, the Outsiders. Bram Stoker's Dracula. It's just so so many excellent films that are either big hits that people talk about or even underrated cult hits and. Um, you know, he's making more small, personal-type films now that's really for himself, but it has a release for the public. Which might not sit with everybody. Um, um, but, you know, he's uh, <clears throat> making the stuff he wants to make, and uh, sometimes that's... Uh, really what matters, you know, he's done the commercial stuff and has uh, made excellent movies and he's uh, even, you know, has a winery so he is able to do all this uh, small stuff that only appeals to really him and perhaps his friends also. And that's really it. Um, but, you know, his legacy is incredible and will just, you know, be the kind of, of legacy anybody would really want. Uh, <clears throat> having been influential, having made movies that are revered and uh, talked about to this day. You know, of course, box office is never really all that important, but, you know, it doesn't always hurt when films uh, one makes are, uh, make quite a bit of money. So he has that also. You know, Godfather trilogy, uh, just especially that those movies at least the first two keep getting re-released uh, every like anniversary or so so uh, those at least you know will constantly make money um, <clears throat> and his uh, his his place in film history is secure um, number six is uh, Steven Spielberg um, this is one of the first uh, directors I ever really uh, knew of, uh, aside from somebody else whom I'll get to uh, soon, um, but you know, E.T., um, Indiana Jones films, um, uh, Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan, um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and Jaws. Especially Jaws, I you know really love that film, uh, as I'm sure you all <laughs> know by now. But you know he he is definitely one of the most influential uh, filmmakers to exist. Uh, you know he has been incredible throughout his career. You know he doesn't always make hits. You know some of his films aren't all that great, but there is always an appeal uh, with his movies. I think that's part of the reason why, you know, the, the characters are very, you know, uh, you know, the, the, you know, they are very human, um, uh, which helps with the rewatchability. And he's just incredible with how he makes his stuff, you know, from back in the day with small budget films and, <clears throat> you know, not a whole lot of money to then huge big blockbuster films, you know. It's just incredible, you know, Jurassic Park also, um, also producing films like, you know, Gremlins and uh, uh, Poltergeist, you know. He, he's he's uh, somebody who's very involved with so many aspects, though, of course, as time goes on, you know, produces so many movies that some of them he might not have 
complete direct involvement in, but you know, he has enough to where he, he allows his name uh, credited as a producer of some sort uh, in the credits. And there's also, of course, also Band of Brothers, the mini series that he did in the Pacific, which is related to that. So he's done a lot in terms of like, like movies and TV. <clears throat> um, but yes, uh, moving on, number five. Quentin Tarantino. Um, now, I mentioned some of his films before. I uh, talked about a few here and there. And I plan to talk about all the movies he's made, directed, at least uh, later this year. You know, because it's the 30th anniversary of Reservoir Dogs, his real, you know, debut. Um, but, you know, he uh, he's somebody with his own style. Very... You know, you can definitely tell that that's a Tarantino film. And, and, you know, you could tell that certain of these guys, it's their movie. Um, sometimes not so much, depending on the kind of movies they tackle. It might always be different. or, uh, But, you know, it, his writing especially is really good. Um, the characters sound, when they talk, they sound like real people. Sound as if, you know... This is believable, like the, especially within the world he you know, creates. Like these characters would say this, and also sometimes like uh, real people who sound like this. So you know he has a great uh, uh, ear when it comes to like dialogue of sorts. Like you know, great with the <clears throat> right. That's probably a terrible analogy to put it, but you know he's very good. Like he's very keen on. Like listening to how people talk in real life and then sort of incorporating stuff like that into his scripts and then directing you know he's very very efficient um very very good at what he does you now even though his films may be very violent and have a lot of bad language uh, in them uh, they're all entertaining nonetheless so you know and in many and in a lot of ways that's very important because, um, you know, if I, like, unless it's like a documentary, you know, if I walk out of a movie, I'm not, I haven't been really entertained, then for me, the film didn't work. It was not very good. You know, you know, even whatever one's thoughts of what his worst film would be, um, or least favorite, whatever you want to say, his at least would always, you know, be very good even at, at the worst. Again, whatever that would be. So, <clears throat> Tarantino is very, uh, uh, really good at what he does. Um, number four, Clint Eastwood. Now, I haven't really talked a whole lot about his movies, but I, but I enjoy a whole lot of his movies. Unfortunately, I've also never seen a single Eastwood movie where he is the lead character in, in a theater. I have just never seen one. I don't know why, it just has never happened for me. Uh, didn't get to see his newest one, uh, Cry Macho. I still haven't even seen it, so I don't know if that's good at all. Some people say it isn't. Yeah, who knows. But uh, if he keeps making movies, I will... I will make an effort to absolutely, no matter what, I will see his next movie, if he's in it too, not just directing. Because I saw American Sniper, you know, and some other stuff, but I haven't, I have never seen a single movie he has ever starred in on the big screen, uh, brand new or re-released. Um, and I don't want to talk about, like, Dirty Harry and all that stuff, because he only directed one of those movies, which is Sudden Impact, the fourth film, um, which is a great movie, um. <clears throat> I think, you know, uh, really well made. Um, you know, uh, Play Misty for me was his first film he ever made um, as a director. Um, and I have a whole bunch of them right here. Um, Mystic River. Uh, Invictus. Uh, Gran Torino is excellent. I think in a lot of ways, Gran Torino is probably his greatest performance of his whole 
career, honestly. Um, my favorite movie that he has ever made um, is Unforgiven. Uh, I just love that movie. I think that's just an excellent film. You know, that's just one of the like, uh, one of the greatest, if not uh, you know, one of the greatest westerns of all time. And I think it might be my favorite western of all time. I think that actually might be the case and um, again with his history in westerns like also the outlaw Josie Wales he directed and starred in uh, and also of course his acting days of uh, on Rawhide you know as Rowdy Yates and of course the Dollar trilogy you know he, he really you know made a great capper with that and um, uh, Cray Matra seems to be like the only Western he has made since, you know, that's like the only Western he's made since, though I've heard some debate whether or not that's actually a Western, but I'll, I won't know until I watch it for myself. Um, number three, <clears throat> uh, Martin Scorsese. I, I love Martin Scorsese, um, you know, Raging Bull, Goodfellas, The, the Departed, uh, all excellent films, The Irishman. Um, I haven't been, I have never really been big of a fan of Wolf of Wall Street. Um, I know a lot of people love that film. Um, for me, it seems like he was really just trying to push the R rating into where, like, you know, didn't need to see we didn't really have to see all those sex scenes like in the film I mean we get it within the first like 45 minutes to like an hour and the film's like three hours anyway like within the first hour or so for me at least I understand I get it and you know while I have no problem with sex and stuff in the films at the same time when I found out that part of the reason there's so much in the Wolf of Wall Street was because he wanted to sort of push the R rating uh, as much as he could. That to me kind of uh, upon s uh, subsequent viewings of the film it just kind of lowered it for me in a way. I don't know. I don't know if I can even explain properly but even then um, you know not a horrible movie at all but not one that I think is his best you know I'll just say that I would never put it in my top 10 you know perhaps top 20 um, I don't know I haven't seen silence either I don't know why I haven't seen silence um, I don't know why I said it like that because you know that sort of implies I haven't seen the wolf of Wall Street what I definitely have um, games of New York is really good um, uh, King of Comedy is underrated um, Mean Streets is great and of course I love Taxi Driver I'm sure all of you know that by now uh, I talked about it quite a bit um, you know I just I just love that film it's really incredible um, very good character study also of a man who has problems needs help but isn't able to get help uh, especially back then so you know uh, what happens in the film happens unfortunately um, but yeah Martin Scorsese he's a great filmmaker has a very good uh, good eye and, you know likes uh, realism and He's just incredible. Uh, nothing more I can really say uh, that hasn't been said, honestly. Uh, number two, Stanley Kubrick. Um, I, I love Dr. Strangelove. My favorite comedy of all time. My favorite film he has ever made. Um, there's also the, uh, the, the Shining, which is also really good. Clockwork Orange. I enjoy that. Full Metal Jacket's really good. Um, 2001. 
eh, fine film. Uh, I don't love it as much as so many people do. But that does not at all, of course, mean I think it's bad. I enjoy it. I think it's a very fine film. I mean, I actually saw it has a double feature with a clockwork orange. So clearly I like it enough to spend over three hours in a movie theater to watch it, uh, along with another film. Um, <clears throat> and he, 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 he's somebody who is very diverse in what he does. You know, you could never really peg um, Kubrick into, into like one genre. He did so many others, like war, comedy, uh, horror. crime, science fiction, and just, you know, Barry Lyndon, you know, period piece, and so many films like that, they're always different, they were never really the same, and, that, and that's somebody, that's something that most filmmakers don't seem to do, of course that doesn't mean that those who just do similar things all the time are bad, you know, it's like they know what they're good at. They might not be able to do anything else except for this sort of film. So they stick with what they're good at and they do it well. Um, but Kubrick always tried to do things differently and I, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, <clears throat> and number one, I actually have a tie. Um, some might say that's cheating. But it's my list and I can have... Um, have any kind of tie I want, um, and I don't really care if uh, people think that's cheating. You know, you can make your own list, and if you want to have ties, you can. If you don't, then don't. But for number one, uh, for me, it's between uh, Christopher Nolan and uh, George Lucas. Um, now Christopher Nolan's work, I have talked about. Well, I've actually I've talked about all their films, so. I think, if anything, the fact that I've already covered every single movie they have made, in terms of directing at least, shows how much I enjoy their work. Um, whatever their my least favorite films of theirs uh, they've made, um, you know, whatever it is, you know, it depends on uh, ranking and such. Also, I guess perhaps producing also comes in uh, could come into question because also this is just filmmakers you know it doesn't have to be just directors um, you know they're in different a uh, aspects of the um, uh, their profession and so you know yeah, Christopher Nolan does a lot of mind-bending uh, kind of movies um, you have to pay attention, you know, you can't just sort of tune out for five minutes and then be expected to be able to understand every single thing that has happened in the movie because you missed a uh, part of it. It could have been a very crucial part and you just tuned out for a certain amount of time. You know, it could be just like five minutes, but it could be a very uh, crucial five minutes and now you don't know what's going on. That's the kind of guy he is, and he, he trusts the audience to understand what he's doing. Like, you know, he, he's not making anything he couldn't understand. He believes his audiences are smart, which I like. And he trusts them, and, like, you can see this film and understand it. Um, and if you can't understand the first viewing, by, by the second or third, you'll be able to understand what's going on. I think that's something that helps with the rewatchability of his movies. You're able to understand things and appreciate them the more you watch them. Uh, you know, Dunkirk, Tenet, Inception, Prestige, um, Interstellar, uh, Insomnia, Memento, Following, um, and of course the Dark Knight Trilogy. Um, I love the Dark Knight Trilogy quite a bit. Uh, I talked so much about them that, you know, I'm sure so many of you are tired and don't ever want to hear me ever uh, uh, speak their, uh, the names of those movies ever again. Um, though, unfortunately, I probably will because of the 
what the year is and how there's a sort of a significance to this year and uh, that trilogy. So something will be made uh, later in the year, but you know, uh, just 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 keep that in mind. Um, and for George Lucas, you know, THX Eleven Thirty Eight, uh, great film. American Graffiti is incredible. Indiana Jones, you know, also, you know, he and Spielberg uh, did those films. I see those as much as uh, George Lucas's films as much as Spielberg's, because, you know, if you watch those movies, you can really see his <clears throat> imprint in there. You know, <clears throat> no matter how subtle, his his influence is there. <clears throat> You know, he also produced, like, Willow and uh, some other films. So many films that have become cult classics now. And uh, that's just great. Uh, films that at one point weren't popular all of a sudden become popular years later, like THX. I think that's great because it's like, you know, people are sort of like rediscovering these movies and that they like oh he had a hand in this or he made that wow and then of course you know there is Star Wars um, uh, the <clears throat> original alone made it so he could retire and never make a single movie ever again in his life uh, due to the merchandising and everything with that uh, he, he was just set for life after that and um you know, even though he didn't direct f 5 and 6, again, like with Indiana Jones, his influence is clearly there. You know, he was there on the sets of those films, he talked about to the directors before, during the shooting, and was involved in the editing and effects and so much that he's, he's somebody whom I, I really respect. And then with the prequels, you know, he made it even bigger and expanded the story and you know from the you know how Palpatine's rise to power comes sort of slowly and then he gets the power and then he uh, executes it so he stays in power and is the Emperor throughout the original trilogy and then, of course, you know, they're the original Star Wars, Episode Four. It's my favorite movie of all time. Like, if I was to just say, what's my favorite movie? Say Star Wars. Like, you know, six like are like one film uh, for me. But if I had to just pick one movie out of all of those, uh, New Hope, um, you know, Episode Four, or Star Wars, whatever you want to call it, the original will always be my favorite film. I believe it was the very first movie I ever saw in my life. Um, uh, at least <clears throat> in terms of what I remember. Um, I really, I really love uh, that film because of the story and the characters and just everything about it. You know, those movies are really space opera to their definition. The melodrama and the theatrical acting, and how George Lucas really wants his actors to sort of like actors and actresses to be, you know, reminiscent of the 1930s uh, style of acting, where it was a still, it was like still a bit over the top because people have to adjust to sound, so they have to be re more reserved than they're used to. Um, and also, um, the combination of a documentary type feel where, you know, the, the, this is real, this is happening, you know, and not just in Star Wars, but THX and American Graffiti, like, there's like a, you wanted like a documentary feel, and while people criticize his writing, um, I think with Star, the Star Wars films, he really honed in on where he was great at, you know, with space opera, able to have the melodrama uh, with, from the dialogue and the situations fit with the theatrical slash documentary type 
feel of how he likes to make movies. You know, and he, he was also very great at editing. Um, he, he, he's just uh, incredible. And of course, you know, ILM that he created and Skywalker Sound, THX for sound for like theater and, you know, all these things, and LucasArts, uh, all these things that he did, you know, that which helped, you know, inspire filmmakers. And of course, you know, Kurosawa inspired George Lucas. Um, oh, and Christopher Nolan was inspired, of course, by Heat, Michael Mann's Heat, with, um, uh, you know, The Dark Knight, with a crime drama sort of feel to that film. Uh, and uh, Christopher Nolan was also inspired by George Lucas's Star Wars um, to make movies. Uh, apparently, his, some of his first films that he made at home with his dad's Super 8 camera were like little stop motion uh, things called like Space Wars. Um, so he was clearly influenced by Star Wars so much that, you know, that really got him into the notion of wanting to make movies. And so that's incredible and it obviously shows that George Lucas, is, who is just, it, <clears throat> he is very, you know, influential in so many ways. And Christopher Nolan is also, and all these filmmakers I listed are, and so many more. Um, but I wanted to just to limit it to 10 because it's like I could go on and on and this video is already going to be quite um, um, you know, quite long already. Um, might edit here or there uh, uh, or it might be new. Uh, so like if I not, there's a period where I'm not talking because it's like you know might be looking uh, to try and see who's next so that way I can begin to sort of get into the mode of talking about them. I mean, I already, I did look at this, but I wanted to make sure I knew in order who I was talking about that way I didn't screw up. Um, but yeah, uh, these are my, fa uh, my top 10 favorite filmmakers. Um, who are yours? Um, are any of mine <laughs> in your top ten, or are others in your top ten? Um, you know, uh, let me know um, in the comments if you like. And um, yeah, I will uh, see you all next time. Hope all of you will have a you know a great day, great weekend, and a great week. Um, I'm going to take next week off just so I can because uh, I'm gonna see by this point you know Batman the new Batman has come out so I'll probably talk about that and also I will uh, have seen you know murder on the Nile and I want to talk about that so that will be fairly late but the Batman you know uh, might be a little later but you know hopefully you know, I probably won't talk about spoilers in either film but you know at least in terms of discussions of the comments and such, you know, if uh, spoilers come up, um, you know, it's like, well, enough time has passed that those who want to see it have seen those films, um, and we'll talk about them, but yeah. Um, anyway, um, I hope all of you, again, take care, and, uh, Hope you've enjoyed this. I'm sorry for the length, but I wanted to be give certain things as to why I enjoy these filmmakers. Even if some weren't the most in-depth, I wanted to just give a little brief reasoning why. I just like them in their movies. So, hope you've enjoyed this to some extent. Uh, and yeah, see you all next time. Bye.